Hi, I'm Simon and I want to share some information regarding a topic I'm often contacted about and that's a form of breathing tension that's sometimes called air hunger. Ten years ago, I wrote an essay about chronic breathing tension and what's often called air hunger and how I found my way through that confusing experience. And ever since, I've received a steady stream of emails from people experiencing similar challenges and wanting to know more. And I eventually realized that the best way to share this information might be through a series of videos. So, in this video, I'll be offering perspectives on the onset of chronic breathing tension and how and why it develops. I'll also discuss how to address the unconscious interference in the natural movement of the breath and the underlying muscular constriction that are often at the root of chronic breathing tension. And I'll do that with reference to a body of work that I found extremely helpful named the Alexander Technique. And that's been around for about 100 years or so. And then I'll share some suggestions for where to go from here for support in finding your way toward the natural breath. First, I want to provide a little background on how this video came to be. This pattern of chronic breathing tension or air hunger was something that I experienced in a pretty pronounced way when I was around the age of 19 or so. So this was around 2000 to 2003, so a long time ago now. And at that time, I started having the experience of not being able to get a full breath. And it felt like it was a struggle to breathe and like I simply couldn't get enough air. I developed a lot of tension in my upper body and I was constantly reaching with my upper chest to get more air and often chasing after a kind of forced yawn in an attempt to take in more air. But very rarely did I ever feel like I could get a satisfying breath. And this wasn't very noticeable to people who knew me or who interacted with me. It could be disruptive to daily life and to sleep and to things like that, but I was still busy and going about my life and doing things, but this sense of not being able to get a full breath was a constant companion and a pretty troubling and kind of torturous feeling to live with because it always felt like I was starved for air. And I tried everything I could find, so I went to my regular doctor, I went to an ENT specialist, I saw physical therapists and breathing specialists, and I tried all kinds of breathing exercises and physical activity. I went to alternative doctors, I got acupuncture, um, I even had surgery on my sinuses because I was told that that could help. But no matter what I tried, I just couldn't find any relief. And the problem remained firmly in place. And I was quite concerned that I might be in this state for the rest of my life. Eventually, I did get one piece of the puzzle from a physical therapist, which made a significant difference. But I still experienced persistent tension and difficulty, even if less acute than it had been for years afterward. And that continued until I found the Alexander Technique. And that's what really changed everything and opened the way for finally freeing my natural breathing. And that's also when it all finally made sense. So in 2011, I wrote an essay about this whole experience at the suggestion of an Alexander Technique teacher. And the title of that essay was Discovering the Liberated Breath. And that ended up in a book about the Alexander Technique. And I also posted it on my blog, which I'll include the link for that below. And what really surprised me was the number of people who started contacting me about this. And first I was surprised because I simply didn't know that anyone else experienced this situation, this condition. Um, and when I had it, I just couldn't find much about it. So I assumed that I was just some strange case. But then I was also especially surprised because the article was just on my website as a musician and it wasn't on a health website or anything like that. 
And the essay itself is really long and kind of complicated. So it was kind of shocking to me that people went to the trouble of wading through that essay and often numerous times and reading it really closely and then contacting me with questions. But what I learned was that the only reason they went to all this trouble was that they just couldn't find much else describing in detail what they were going through and the various factors at play. So I started seeing that this issue isn't so rare after all and that people are also struggling to find resources. So I ended up having conversations with a number of people who contacted me and I noticed that they all had very similar stories and experiences to one another. I also found that I was repeating a lot of the same information and answering a lot of the same questions. But most importantly, I couldn't convey all the information I wanted to because it would take too long and I didn't have it organized into a class format. So in light of all that, I ran a live online course in 2018 in collaboration with an excellent Alexander teacher who has a lot of experience and specialized training with breathing. And since then, I've wanted to make some of that key information available to people who are searching for understanding and a way forward with chronic breathing tension. Which brings us to this series of videos. And I want to be clear about who this video is intended for. I think the perspectives in this video and of the Alexander Technique are relevant to natural breathing in general and to breathing tension in many forms. But this video is primarily concerned with a chronic form of breathing tension that's sometimes referred to as air hunger. And it's important here to distinguish between the use of the term air hunger in emergency medical situations to refer to a very specific acute condition and the very different use of the term to refer to non-medical chronic breathing tension. And you might hear the words air hunger used by doctors and health practitioners to refer to each of those two phenomena. And it can therefore sometimes get a bit vague and ambiguous. But I want to be clear that nothing in these videos is intended to be used for any kind of medical diagnosis or medical treatment or for any kind of medical condition because here we're only talking about a non-medical condition, a pattern of breathing tension that's caused by unconscious interference with the natural breath. So these videos and the larger course I've created are designed for people who experience persistent breathing tension or non-medical air hunger and who can't find a way to be free of it. And typically people with this condition experience an abiding sense of not being able to get a full breath and a tendency toward chest breathing. They often have muscle tension in their ribs and shoulders and chest and especially the upper back between the shoulder blades and they may or may not be very aware of this. They often have a constant sense of discomfort or difficulty breathing and sometimes there's a need to frequently force a yawn in a kind of tortured attempt to feel like they're getting a full breath. And for some people these feelings lessen somewhat when they're busy or focused on doing something and therefore they're not consciously noticing their breathing and maybe they don't feel so bad for a few hours. And for others it's just the opposite and they notice the symptoms more when they're more active. And I've seen it manifest in both forms for people many times. I want to be clear that I fully support people getting medical tests and seeing doctors and all of that to rule out possible medical issues. Because if there are medical issues, then it's important to know that and to seek the right care. But the people who have found their way to my essay over the years are typically the ones who have tried many things and nothing has worked. So if that's you, you may have been told there's nothing wrong with you or that it's all in your head or that what you're experiencing is simply anxiety. And 
I know people can get frustrated when air hunger gets dismissed as anxiety because they may be thinking, well, sure, maybe I'm not 100% peaceful in every moment. And yes, I feel kind of anxious now, but that's because I feel like I can't breathe and I didn't feel anxious before I had this problem. Or they may be thinking, yes, I've been anxious before, but now I also feel like I can't breathe. So, of course, any anxiety is now worse. And that's when people usually start searching for more answers and the ones who somehow stumbled upon my essay are the ones I've spoken with over the years. And I know how frustrating and awful it can be to feel like you can't breathe and to then be unable to find any answers. And that's exactly what it was like for me for years and there was also much less information available back then around 2001 or so. So I was really on my own with it and I know how desperate and hopeless that can feel. So my hope is that these videos can help you find your way forward. And there is a way forward because your body and your system do know how to breathe and they do know the way toward natural ease. We simply need to learn how to follow that direction, which at times can seem counterintuitive to our usual ways of thinking. And that brings us to one of the core principles underlying the article I wrote and the course we ran a couple years ago and this video today. Because the truth of the matter is very simple. All you need to do is allow yourself to breathe naturally. Simply let the system breathe as it naturally wants to. The problem is that when someone says to you, breathe naturally, or sit naturally, or walk naturally, what we do in response, so what we think we know how to do, is not actually what is natural. Because often what feels natural is in fact what is habitual. And our felt sense of what is natural is instead obscured by habit. And you could say that this paradox is also at the heart of the human condition. And when someone says to you, just be yourself, which, you know, if we understand that at its deepest level is arguably all you have to do or can do in life, which is to honestly discover and be who you are and continue growing into that in its full expression, well, even then, we usually don't actually know how to allow that either. Because trying to just be ourselves often manifests instead as being our habits, because that's what we have the most familiarity with. All the layers of conditioning that impede really discovering and unfolding into our full expression. But don't worry, because addressing breathing interference can be a whole lot simpler than that whole vast topic of life. But in either case, the question becomes, how then do we go beyond habit to what is more integrated and more coordinated, more whole, more authentic, more natural? We slow things down and we come into contact with the edge of our habits. And then we start to see the interference. And then we've resurrected the power of our choice. And the more we peel away, the more we hone our ability to sense what is true and what is natural versus what is interference. And that's one of the great insights at the heart of the Alexander Technique, which is one of the topics we'll be discussing in this video. Then I'll offer suggestions for how to find the right support and knowledge for this process of restoring your natural breathing. But before we dive into that, let's talk a little about how breathing tension and air hunger develop in the first place. Let's look at how air hunger and breathing tension typically develop. Ordinarily or optimally, breathing happens naturally and efficiently and unconsciously. So it's essentially unconscious, but it is also very intricate. 
and it involves the involuntary movement of the diaphragm and the involuntary movement of supporting muscles throughout the torso. And all of this is coordinated in easeful movement that's free of your own conscious interference. What happens with breathing tension and air hunger is that at some point, and this could happen suddenly or gradually, this natural and somewhat delicate equilibrium is disrupted. So some agent or trauma comes in to disrupt the intricate natural breath. And for some people, this happens suddenly. So they may experience a panic attack or get caught in a car accident. They may experience pronounced illness or extreme stress. So some kind of physically or emotionally traumatic event comes in. Or it could happen gradually, so other people experience prolonged physical imbalance or they're in a prolonged state of fight, flight, or freeze. They might have accumulated muscular tension or they might experience an extended period of depression or anxiety or fear or stress. So the sense of generally being out of sync with yourself and with your system for an extended period of time. Often this might also involve our stress response becoming a long-term habit or state that leads to tension and chest breathing over time. And then this fight, flight, or freeze state, even at a low level, leads to constriction in our breathing patterns. But it could also be as simple as habitual postural collapse or restriction in our upper body over time that disconnects us from our natural breath. And that could even be from sitting at a computer all day, every day in a particular way or regularly leaning over a musical instrument in a particular way. So whatever happens, there's something that comes in to disrupt our breathing long enough that we get pulled into a cycle that takes us away from equilibrium and constricts our breathing patterns. And what this means is basically our ribs and our secondary breathing muscles can't move as freely as they used to. So the whole movement of the breath gets limited and we therefore feel like we're getting a less full breath. So it feels like we're no longer getting a complete breath. And then to compensate for this restricted mobility in our natural breath, we instinctively start reaching to get a fuller breath. And for a while, this pattern of reaching for air like with the chest maybe doesn't feel like much of a problem. But what can happen is that it becomes a self-reinforcing cycle, and that's when it can start to feel distressing. Because as we begin chest breathing to compensate for this feeling of not getting a complete breath, the underlying problem actually starts getting worse. Because as we try to pull in more air by reaching high in the chest, we further tighten our upper back muscles, our chest muscles, and our ribs, and this restricts the free movement of our breath even further. On top of that, we get caught in a cycle of inhalations that actually makes it harder for us to get a full breath because we're not exhaling fully, and the exhalations are part of what would allow space for a fuller breath to come in. So then the sense you have is that the only way to get air is to reach for more breath. And this provides some temporary relief, but like any kind of addiction, it reaches a ceiling whereby it doesn't work anymore. So you keep reaching for air high in the chest, sometimes chasing after a yawn because this is the only way you can get the feeling of a full breath. But often you can't find that sense of the full breath you're seeking because everything has gotten so restricted. Or in less severe cases, this restricted movement in the breath might simply lead to an abiding feeling of an unsatisfying breath and a sense of discomfort in your breathing without that habit of reaching for air. In any case, what had been unconscious, which was more or less easy breathing, gets out of sync. And because of the discomfort caused by our own interference, we now become very conscious of our breathing and especially conscious of what's not working. 
And in a perfect world, ideally our system would return to normal and find its natural equilibrium again. But because breathing is so visceral, often we're unable to find our way back to equilibrium once that feeling of air hunger begins. It's like a kind of survival impulse gets activated because it's so distressing to feel like you're not getting a full breath. And we get tangled up in trying to cope or compensate. So this is chronic breathing tension or air hunger. Essentially, it's restriction of your natural breathing that makes you feel like you can't get enough air. And it's often coupled with an entrenched habit of reaching for an artificial sense of a full breath. And you might think, okay, well, if chest breathing is the problem, let's just fix it by belly breathing. Unfortunately, it's not as simple as making chest breathing the enemy and adopting belly breathing or counted breathing or any other fix in which you are effectively manipulating your breath in one way or another. And this is because your natural breath is not a result of control or something of your own doing. You can't do natural breathing. It happens on its own when we learn to recognize and release our interference. So you might find some partial relief in belly breathing and similar techniques, and these can sometimes offer some mild improvement. But ultimately, the way these methods are usually taught, they simply add more interference on top of a situation, chronic breathing tension, that was itself created by interference. And so as I describe in the essay I wrote, following those methods complicated my situation in significant ways. And I eventually had to undo all of that additional interference. And what I've come to believe is the reason people get so stuck in these tension patterns and the reason it's so difficult to find answers is because the way through it is counterinstinctual and often counterintuitive. And I think this is why you may find that many of the people you go to for help can probably see that you're not breathing well because they'll notice the tension and the restriction in your breathing. And they also probably know what normal breathing looks like. But a lot of people seem to have the same experience that I did years ago, which is that it's very difficult to find reliable guidance on how to get from one state to the other. And I think this is partly because the way home to our easeful breathing is counter to our usual ways of approaching things. So I'll just highlight this key principle. Freedom comes from finding your way to the natural breath. The natural breath is involuntary. It's not something you can do. It's something that does itself when you learn to get out of the way. And then, of course, the big question becomes, well, how do we get out of the way? First, we learn to recognize the habits that are at play. Then we recognize that these habits require doing and effort and interference. Even though they at first seem like they're automatic and like they're happening all on their own, they actually require some effort on our part. And then we learn to stop reinforcing those habits. One final piece is that we also need to restore our system's natural movement because the natural movement has often been so restricted in cases of chronic breathing tension that it needs to be reawakened. As we follow this process, we can stop reinforcing the habits, allow those habits to unwind, and learn to trust and listen to the natural intelligence of our system restoring itself. So that's the way, and it takes some patience and some resolve, but it's also a powerful teacher and one that can, I think, turn what feels like a curse into a great gift. <laughs>